Okay guys, so I'm gonna make this super quick for starting off. Hello, it is Monday, August 16th. It's about 10 to three in the afternoon and I am gonna be getting ready to start The Wind Through the Keyhole by Stephen King. This is book 4.5 in the Dark Tower series. This is essentially supposed to be, from what I can tell, a prequel of essentially kind of similar to what we saw with Wizarding Glass, which if you haven't watched my Dark Tower books, I should by the time this video goes, goes out have a playlist specifically for the Dark Tower, but this is part of my Stephen King reading series where I've been reading his books chronologically ever since they came out with series being back to back to back to understand the full scope of the series. I'm talking really fast because my camera's gonna die and I need to like get this out as soon as possible. So piggybacking off of Wizarding Glass, which was a really extensive book and so far my favorite book in the entire series, that dealt with a huge amount of prequel information where Roland goes back and tells a huge story that led to him searching for the Dark Tower and this is supposed to be kind of a continuation of that. The back of the book says that Roland Deschain and his quartet, Jake, Susanna, Eddie, and Oi, the Billy Bumbler, encounter a ferocious storm just after crossing the River Wye on their way to the Outer Barony. A shelter from the Howling Gale, Roland tells his friends two stories that cast new light on his troubled past. They are from Roland's early days as a gunslinger and involved a murderous shapeshifter, a skin man who inspires fear and wonder, fantasies and bedtime stories, and one boy's savagely real nightmare. This did get published in 2012. This was actually published years and years and years after the original books were finished because people wanted to know more about Roland and some of the other adventures he'd gone on because the reason that people love the Dark Tower so much is because they love Roland as a character. It's one of the major reasons why people love this series and love what Stephen King has done with this. Apart from the fact that many of Stephen King's other works fall into this area, into this world essentially. Roland is just by himself a very interesting complex guy and so learning his stories was really interesting to learn about in Wizard and Glass and so when the series ended people kept asking for more of that and so in 2012 Stephen King did come out with this short novel. This is about 309 pages worth of text so this is actually slightly longer than The Gunslinger but not by a whole heck of a lot truthfully probably like 50 pages but very excited to start this because i'm just really interested to see how this goes this video is going to be a lot shorter than the other ones i've done because i feel like 100 pages is a good benchmark for each time i come back to talk with you guys about this book so this video should be much shorter than the rest of them considering how short this book is but nonetheless i will still go through and talk things through with you guys about what happens things of that nature because if you've been watching any of my videos Videos, they're spoiler filled so that's a huge warning for you guys right now this is gonna be filled with spoilers I need to go because my camera's gonna die and I will see you guys when I reach the page hundred mark it is going on nine o'clock please excuse how stuffy I sound my nose has been absolutely awful today because when we get to the end of summer going into the beginning of fall my allergies go so out of whack we have reached page 107 of the width of the keyhole this is actually going to be really interesting because this is basically a frame tale, which if you're not really aware of what a frame tale is, it's basically a story within a story within a story. The story starts out where essentially after the events of Wizard and Glass, in the first part, which is called Stark Blast, we follow the gang that have left the Green Palace that essentially was like a literal adaptation of sorts of the Emerald Palace from the Wizard of Oz. And after dealing with essentially Randall Flagg, who's the man in black, who's Martin, who is various other names that Roland knows him by, and the TikTok man who eventually, who essentially was killed, they end up leaving this area and start heading back toward the Dark Tower once again. As they're traveling, they come across this river that's called the River Wye, and they end up also coming across this old man who goes by the name of Bix. Now, while this is all happening, Oi, who is their Billy Bumbler, he's kind of the equivalent of like, a pet essentially he starts to kind of go a little crazy like they don't know what is going on he's barking at stuff he's acting very strange and come to find out oi knows bix and we learn that bix basically is this 120 year old man who's seen everything he knows a lot of stuff and he talks about how there is this storm coming in called a stark blast and Roland knows what that is because he's been in Midworld long enough to know like what they are and how to signify them and what to do when they come. And Bix basically says that he'll take 
them down the river Y to this little town where they can rest and they can wait, excuse me, out the storm. And they talked to him about exactly what happened in Lud before they got on Blaine, the train, and the motto, whatever you want to call him. And they talk about their adventures up to there, basically. So what a Stark Blast ends up being that Roland tells the gang once they get to this place, which is like this little deserted village, is that a Stark Blast is essentially pre-told by the fact that there's extreme heat that is outside of the norm for several days, and then this huge gust of cold comes in. It's 40 degrees basically below freezing. There's strong winds. It's devastating. It's it's basically the antithesis of a desert storm where it has the same idea going behind it, but it's instead of it being extreme heat and sand, it's like extreme cold and wind kind of thing. So they get to this place and they start trying to basically prepare the, the, the what was the town hall for a shelter and they get caught in the storm and from there Roland decides he's going to tell a story that kind of has another story involved in it. It's, it's the equivalent of two stories that are kind of wrapped into each other about something that happened pretty much immediately after the events that Roland shows Eddie, Susanna, Jake, and Oi, which was the death of his mother by his own hand, but not necessarily his own fault. So that takes us to the, the Skin Man Part 1, which starts off this story, and it goes a little bit into kind of the whole thing about his mother's death. Now, what we learn in Wizard and Glass is that after returning to Gilead from Magus and losing Susan in a very, very violent death, essentially Roland goes back home and his mother is looking to talk with him. She, he goes to basically confront her and kills her by accident. Basically because Rhea had concocted this entire thing where I don't know necessarily whether he saw something or whether it was he was kind of in this fit of unrecognized rage that he killed his mother. Anyway, he shoots and kills his mom but under the influence of Rhea and he's really depressed about it because his mother was a good woman who was very depressed and was basically being, I guess, kind of blackmailed into a relationship with Martin, who was the magician that Roland and his father had both known his mother was having an affair with. So anyway, he basically says that about, it's like six months after his mother dies, his father decides to send him with this guy named Jamie out to this place that is called Debaria. And Debaria is known for having this very well-established whorehouse, I guess, something along those lines. It's filled with women who are ru rumored to be man-eaters, literally, and it's, you know, otherwise got like this little town involved in it. It's a very nice town kind of idea. And Steven says that the reason he's sending Roland out on this is because there's this monster, supposedly, that is going through and ravaging the town. It's killing a bunch of people all over town. They don't know what's causing it, but it's been happening for weeks now, and it seems to be that every night this creature comes by and feeds, and it kills people, and it leaves this awful path of destruction. So Jamie and Roland start heading to Debaria, where Roland tells Jamie kind of the lowdown of how many people have been killed, if there's been any witnesses, that kind of thing, and they just kind of go on their way. They uh, end up getting to Debaria, and the woman that runs the women's house, essentially, call it Serenity, and the woman that runs at Everlyn basically brings out this woman, Fortuna, who was attacked by the monster and lived, and they keep talking about how this thing kind of shapeshifts because some people have seen it as a bear, some people have seen it as a lion or a tiger, and then also there's times where they see it as a man. So they're not 100% sure what this is, but it sounds like some kind of sh like shape shifter or shape changer of some kind. But they don't know where it came from or what its purpose is, or even if the person that has this even knows that they're doing this kind of a thing. So then after they essentially meet up with the high sheriff, who is the man that had asked for somebody to come help them with this, the high sheriff sheriff basically gives them more of a lowdown and he actually tells a story about how he knows Stephen specifically Roland's father and how when Stephen was a lot younger they 
basically had worked together on something and how brave Stephen was and how it really inspired him to step up and take care of this town and become the high sheriff. But once this entire case is put to rest, he's basically going to retire because he doesn't think that he's cut out to do this anymore. He's older. He's not really willing to do many more mysteries, as he puts it. And he lets the boys end up camping in the cells of the police station, basically, because they have nowhere else really to sleep. And overnight, they hear about how there is another attack made at this ranch called the Jeff Jefferson Ranch. And they go there and they see the destruction. They start to plot out basically what had happened and come across this boy that goes by the name of Young Bill, who is like 10, 11 years old. He's very young and he's really scared. He's not hurt, but he saw a lot of what happened. And so Roland tries to talk to him about what happened with the sheriff and with Jamie next to him. And the kid's not really saying much. And Roland thinks it's because he's scared and he doesn't really remember a lot because trauma will make people forget things a lot of time. And so he decides that he's going to send Jamie off to do something to distract the high sheriff and other people just to kind of get this kid alone with him because Roland has this ability where he's able to hypnotize people and get them to remember things about what happened to them without like them really knowing it. He did this to Susan a couple of times in Wizard and Glass and so we know he already is able to do this. So he does this with young Bill essentially and learns that a, there's a lot more to the monster than it seems because the kid sees that he goes from a bear to a tiger of sorts to a man and there's a blue ring tattooed around the foot of this guy. We don't see his face, we don't know what he looks like, all young Bill is able to say is that he has a ring around his foot, which after Roland brings this kid to the jail just so that he could be safe in a cell and, you know, he's protected. He talks to two of the deputies that are there and they talk about how there is this place that is now a ghost town. It used to be a, basically a town that was particularly reserved for criminals. You know, it was like a jail town of sorts. And then something basically had happened there where a bunch of people left or something and then it became this place where a group of harriers or basically bad guys, I guess I'll call them, they took it over for a few years and then they left and now it's just been completely abandoned. And so the tattoo was supposed to be like a marker of the people that were, you know, in this area. They said that basically anyone who ever did time in this town, in this place called Beely Town, had one. They don't know if it was for punishment or just identification in case one of them ran off, but about 10 years ago when the stockade had originally closed, they stopped doing it. So that's when the Harriers were able to get into the town and take it over, and then about five years later they abandoned it, so it's been a ghost town ever since. And so that kind of gives Roland some information because they already were looking at this mining area that likely would have something to do with what's going on because they think that because the mines have opened up this new tunnel, it could have unearthed some really devastatingly awful creatures or demons of sorts. And it's likely to them that because of that, one of the miners could possibly be possessed by this demon entity. And so they're looking at them, but now with this new information, Roland's like, okay, let's bring these guys in, have Bill look at them and by their ankles and see if we can find somebody that has this blue ring around their ankle, because at the very least, that's all they can go off of at this point. And so then he decides to give Bill the opportunity to relax, and he eats with him, and the boy's like, can you tell me this story that you were going to tell me earlier, which is called The Wind Through the Keyhole? And it's a story that keeps getting brought up every now and then, because essentially Roland is finding a lot of similarities in how this whole thing is going to what the story talks about. And so this next part that basically I ended on, which is the beginning of The Wind Through the Keyhole, is going to be the most of this book. And it's going to be the story that Roland tells Bill that is being told then by Roland much older. So basically we've got this frame tale where we have the real story of Roland, Jake, Eddie, Susanna, and Oi in the more present time and Roland is telling the story from when he was 14 on this case for finding this skin man which then 
in that story, he tells this little kid, Bill, the story of the wind through the keyhole, which is a story he's known for years because it was one of his mother's favorite stories to tell him and one of his favorite stories to hear. So interesting how this is all kind of playing together. Now, I'm not really certain why Roland decided he wanted to tell this. Again, I think this is a lot of the things that kind of are leading up to us understanding why Roland goes for the Dark Tower, because this is still before any of that happens. This is still before he actually goes off to search for the man in black. This is kind of like almost an interlude kind of story in a sense, because I believe with Wolves of the Kala, we're going to see more of the reason, like more of what exactly happens when Roland decides to actually leave. This is still kind of like a younger role and that doesn't really know what he's doing as of yet. Hey guys, so it is going on, I think 7.30 on Tuesday. So I haven't finished the book yet, obviously, but I did end up getting to page 200 earlier today and I didn't really have a lot of time to sit and record earlier when I was able to because my sister was taking a test and she can hear me from the basement which is which is where her room is and just wasn't really good timing and then I took a nap after work. So I did reach page 200 which basically starts off this story of the wind through the keyhole. Now what we've learned about the wind through the keyhole is basically it's a story about this little boy named Tim who lives in essentially mid-world and the story follows him as he's a young boy who's just found out that his father was killed in the woods. There are these iron woods in this place called the Endless Forest that is kind of just off the edge of this little town he lives in and essentially what they learn is that this forest is dangerous like you get too far into the forest and monsters are likely to be around and it actually has killed many people and so the forest is kind of scary for a lot of people but the ironwood that you can get from the trees can be sold for money and that's actually how a lot of people make their money in this town is going and cutting down the ironwood and bringing it to town to sell and that specifically was what his father was doing before he had died and unfortunately when it comes to the point where the tax man basically comes around, known as the Covenant Man, Nell, who is Tim's mother, becomes really fraught with worry because she doesn't think that they're gonna have enough money to be able to pay the tax man and then that would cause them to lose their home. Because this guy is very ruthless in terms of being paid his exact amount on time and he even, like many tax-based systems that we have in the world, a lot of the ways that people are taxed are fairly, pretty unfair and it's dependent on how many people are in your home, your land, all that kind of stuff and it's just a big hassle. So what she ends up deciding is she gets involved with this man who was a friend and partner of her late husband who says that he will marry her in order to bring in some extra money and he just kind of fancies her but he's also a very well-known alcoholic and she says to Tim that he's quit the drink, that he's better, he's fine, and that he's gonna make it so that they can end up staying in their home that they love. And Tim's very not sure about this because he knows this friend whose name is Big Cal's that he's a drinker and it's very clear very early on especially after they get married that he's not really done with drinking because when especially he does drink he becomes very abusive and hits Tim's mother and Tim is not a big fan of him he actually ends up having Tim quit schooling that he's being involved in with this woman that they call the widow smack who basically is like this older woman who kind of has some magical possible things and she knows things like math essentially and so Big Kells basically tells him he's not allowed to do that anymore and he's gonna be working at this sawmill and essentially what we also find out is that when the tax man comes he takes aside Tim and is like hey I have this key that should open something that you'll know that will basically have some of your father's stuff in it because when his father was killed he was missing his lucky coin that he took with him everywhere he went and his hand axe that was super important they went missing and nobody was able to to find them. So Tim takes this key and he goes to this trunk that Big Kells has that he sits on all the time when he smokes and opens it and finds the lucky coin hidden at the bottom of the trunk and this leads Tim to start wondering what really happened to his dad because it seems like his dad's accident may have not really been an accident and then he goes to the tax man on the edge of the Ironwood Forest and essentially finds out that 
Big Kel was the one that actually killed his dad for some unknown reason. We're not 100% sure why that was, whether it was because he wanted Nell or for whatever reason. And basically, Tim is able to also then get the hand axe because the tax man ends up giving it to him. And we find out too that while this is happening, Big Kel finds out the Lucky Coin's mi coin is missing and blames Nell for it, and so he beats the crap out of her to the point where she becomes blind because her brain was so swelled up, it caused her to lose her sight. And when Tim finds that out, he goes back home, tries to take care of her, and tells people in town that Big Cal has actually been the one that killed his father and his father was a very well respected man in this town so everybody is hell bent on finding Big Cal but nobody can seem to find him and they hold the funeral for his father much more appropriately than they had done before and they're all basically looking to Tim now as truthfully a grown man even though he's only 12 years old at this point. What we also figure out is that the Widow Smack brings Tim aside and tells him that this tax man is much more darker and sinister than he believes because she has seen him for years. He's been around for a very long time and he practices some very dark arts. And when Tim basically decides that he's going to look into this basin that is like a fortune telling scrying thing that the tax man had shown him before which had showed Tim that his mother was being beaten by Big Kel, he sees that there is this house in the woods that he can go to that will provide him with this blindfold that he can put on his mom to return her sight. So he decides to go out there and find it, but then realizes that all of that was basically just a big lie. He gets into this like, not firefight for, per se, but something happens where he starts shooting because he does end up getting a gun that is also basically the equivalent of like what a gunslinger would have because the Widow Smack gives that to him in order to protect himself and it only has so many bullets and she said that there's only been one other person who's used it and that was her brother who had died years ago and he comes across these people who were supposedly the, pl the people of this place called Fanganard and they think that that Tim is a gunslinger because of the way he's able to use the gun, which is like kind of unheard of. This kind of gun is not well used by other people because it's kind of one of those things where only the, the right people can use it, even if they've had no training with it per se. So far my thoughts on this are it's fine. I don't think this is exactly though what I had expected in terms of my enjoyment. I think that it's overall a really cool like secondary story but the whole time I'm reading this I'm still wondering what the point is, what the point is, and what is it about this story that is going to tie into the case that Roland's involved as a young boy and then how does that play into what is currently going on in the actual storyline with Roland, Eddie, Susanna, Jake, and Oi. So that's kind of where my head is at. I'm not really sure where the ties are coming in where the threads are going with it. I would like to see this kind of be a little bit more enticing. Otherwise, it's pretty much a three star at this point. It's not too bad, but as far as my enjoyment, it's kind of one of those things where you can read it, you don't have to, but if you do, it might give a little bit more, you know, story to the Dark Tower. But it's n at this point to me, it's not necessarily a necessity to read in terms of the Dark Tower. Okay, guys, so it is going on 11 o'clock at night and I have finished The Wind Through the keyhole. So I apologize if I don't really look at the camera too much. Uh, it's very dark in my room because it's the middle of the night and I have to use the flash on my phone to see anything. So <laughs> I'm a little blind. That's why I also took my glasses off. So we're gonna have to deal with this. Tim, he had come across these mud men that basically were thinking he was a gunslinger, which is not necessarily untrue. It's just not 100% true either. Um, and essentially what we learn is that these mud men, they revere him. They find him very powerful in a sense, and they communicate with him and give him food and shelter and warn him of an incoming Stark blast that is coming. And they give him this disc that has some buttons on it and it can provide light. It can basically act as like a compass. And you learn that it's basically kind of this smart device in a sense and they give this to him and tell him to keep heading north because it's going to keep directing him north and the item calls itself Daria. You learn that it also has certain directives in it that you know help protect Tim and there's even the possibility that it used to be his father. Daria ends up taking Tim to 
this area and it, when the Stark Blast comes in it's coming in heavy and Daria at one point completely dies because the Stark Blast cuts off all her power. She leads him though to this area that's called the Dogen and it is this place of magical power because Daria talks about how there are several charging places where this device can recharge and the closest one is this place called the Dogen but the Dogen is currently offline and so in order for him to continue on the path of the beam to the Dark Tower, which is where he's heading, she would have to have him detour, and he decides not to take that. He decides to head toward the Dogen instead. And when he gets there, the Stark Blast is getting really, really heavy, but he sees this cage of a tiger and finds a note with a couple different key sets where there's a key under this box that says that's from this man that is called RF slash MB which leads me to believe this is Randall Flagg who has left this for Tim. They tell him that the key to the Dogen is wrapped around the tiger's neck, so go get it if you dare. And the, like I said, the star class is coming in really quickly, so he unlocks the cage of the tiger, hoping that the tiger's not gonna kill him, and he doesn't. The tiger actually leads Tim to this box that has some magical tools in it, one of which being this napkin-looking, like, sheet, where when it gets unfolded, it becomes bigger and bigger and bigger to the point where it becomes a little shelter for the two of them when the, when the tiger and Tim realize they can't get into the Dogen because it's offline and they need to seek shelter because of the Stark Blast. And you see the tiger is very calm. It's almost as if it knows who Tim is. It's almost as if it's a very human-based tiger. And after the storm finishes, the tiger tells Tim to then open the box again and inside there is this flask of liquid and Tim gives the tiger this liquid, whatever it is, and it turns out that the tiger is actually the wizard Merlin, who we've seen already being mentioned a lot with Wizard and Glass because the orbs that are mentioned in Wizard and Glass were Merlin's orbs. And Merlin is obviously like this very fantasized character like the way that he's revered is similar to the wizard Merlin that you hear about in the tales of King Arthur which is actually a huge part of the Dark Tower series like that's a huge inspiration for Stephen King was King Arthur and Merlin and all these people so Merlin basically says like he thanks Tim for saving him and he says that Tim has become very you know brave and he's going to be rewarded for it and kind of talks about how the man that left him there is much more sinister than the covenant man and the covenant man's kind of just like a henchman of sorts and there's somebody else much more devious much more powerful that he calls the red king which if you're familiar randall flag or the man in black martin whatever you want to call him has been referred to as the Crimson King, Crimson being a shade of red. So very interesting to see how even in this story, the Man in Black is a very prominent character. So from there, Merlin tells Tim that in order for his mother to, to see again, he has to take the flask with a little bit of liquid left in it, take it to her, and the first thing he's supposed to do when he gets to his mom is to put that liquid in her eyes and then give her his father's axe because he is destined to be a gunslinger. He is not destined to end up being like his father, and he's destined to go and do these other amazing adventures as he gets older. And so that's what Tim does. He goes home, and he ends up giving his mother her sight back and unfortunately though before he's able to tell his mother his adventures after giving her the axe he is attacked by Big Kel who has been missing for all this time and had snuck into the house without anybody knowing while Nell was incapacitated and killed the widow's the widow smack who was watching over Nell and tries to kill Tim, but before he's able to, Nell comes up behind him and takes the hand axe and whacks him in the back of the head and kills him. And from there, you know, the story kind of ends. And then we move into the Skin Man Part 2. Roland 
wraps up the story with Billy and he you know answers a few questions that Billy has but he's not able to really answer them because they're kind of just unknown things they're things that his mother was not able to tell Roland when she was telling him the story but basically from there we jump back to the case that Roland is in where they're still trying to find the person that attacked Billy's family and the various other people that have been killed in this town of Debaria. And they round up the salt miners who are known to possibly have some affiliation with the people that were in the town of the prisoners, basically. And they find them, they get them to show their ankles, and they do end up finding the person that's the skin man. And he morphs into this snake creature and starts trying to kill people. And Roland's able to kill the skin man and basically solve the case and go home. And before he does, he joins in the festivities with the town to celebrate that the case has been solved, that people are safe now. And then he goes to the horror house, basically, where Evelyn is. And Evelyn gives Roland a letter that his mother had left there before she returned to Gilead before she died. Because for those of you that aren't aware, at one point after Gabrielle Deschain was found to have been in an affair with Martin Broadcloak, she was sent off to Debaria to the whorehouse to meditate and to be with these women because it's kind of like a, a retreat of sorts also sometimes for women. And while she was there, Martin had apparently come to her and said things to her about the fact that if she was to ever go back to Gilead, Roland would basically kill her. And Gabrielle at that point essentially is going through this really massive sanity break. Because not only does she understand that she's been led on by Martin, but she's been kind of hypnotized or blackmailed or something to that effect. And she leaves a letter for Roland to find when he comes there because she knows that he's going to be there at some point. She knows that Ka is going to turn its wheel and he will end up there at some point in his life. And it's a letter where basically she's asking him for his forgiveness because she knows that she really messed up. She knows that she's been swayed by this evil man. And she just hopes that in the deepest part of his heart, he can forgive her for the transgressions she has done. And then basically from there, we jump back to the story of Eddie, Susanna, Jake, Roland and Oi, where the storm starts to quiet down a little bit and Roland ends the story that he was telling them, which was essentially this frame tale of having the case and then telling Billy the story of the wind through the keyhole. When the storm finally lets up, Susanna starts to look outside and sees everything and she looks to Roland and is like, what was the last thing that she said in the letter? Because he didn't say. And essentially it was the fact that he had, she had asked for his forgiveness. And Susanna asks him if he does end up forgiving her, if he did forgive her for what happened, because she knows that Roland knows that what had happened to her was not of her own choosing exactly. And Roland doesn't say anything, but essentially it was yes, that he did forgive her. Because you can even tell in the times that he talks about his mother that there's so much love there that you can tell that he had eventually forgave her, but, you know, he doesn't actually say it kind of thing. And that's pretty much where we end off the wind the, through the keyhole. That's pretty much the entirety of the story. So overall, I ended up giving it a four out of five stars because I did actually enjoy the story. I think that especially the story of Tim just got a little bit a lot better as more it went on. And the only thing I will say, though, is I feel like this just wasn't really necessary. Like this is a story that you read for shits and giggles when you finish The Dark Tower. Like there's no real, you know, necessity for this. I love Roland as a character that I feel like I will read anything he's in because I just adore him that much. So this was totally fine as like a prequel story and kind of an interwoven, you know, break point between the intensity that there was in Wizard and Glass and what will be in The Wolves and Wolves of the Kala. But the thing is, is for people that are looking to read The Dark Tower and are wondering if this is something you should have to read, it's not 100% necessary, but if you find to really love the character of Roland and want to know more of some of the adventures he had gone on, 
this is definitely something worth the read. I think that it's definitely worth the time. It's something, like I said, you probably could read after you finish the main series if you chose to, or you could do like I did and read it as a midway point through the series. Either way will work because it doesn't really have anything to do with the main plot. It's more of just kind of a break period between Wizarding Glass and Wolves of the Kala because this just goes into, like I said, Roland telling a story about his adventures after the one he had talked about in Wizarding Glass. So, you know, it's kind of, if you would like to read it, you're more than welcome to, but it's not really all that necessary. But let me know if you guys actually ended up reading this yourself, if you're a fan of the Dark Tower series at all, and what your thoughts were on it, because I'm curious to know if people were more along the lines of they thought it was important to read or if it's like kind of one of those for shits and giggles kind of stories where it's just you read it just to see what else Roland could be have possibly been up to as a child. But if you guys did enjoy this video please do give it a big thumbs up and if you're not already and you'd like to be and would like to see more content like this go ahead and hit that button down below and subscribe to become an owl at in our flock and I will see all of you guys in my next video. Bye guys!